2021 was a rough season for the Texans and their fans. Their quarterback didn't want to play. At least, not football. J.J. Watt left for greener pastures. The desert. Head coach and befuddled baked potato Bill O'Brien was gone, but the stench of his musky ghost still permeated the halls as the franchise was bereft of draft picks for the first two rounds. The Texans failed to find an inspiring new hire as head coach and settled for David Culley. Nobody expected Jack from this man. He was a human bookmark. Fired as soon as the season ended for philosophical differences. It's just like Frederick Nietzsche said, fire David Culley. But really, they won four games. Culley at least deserved a slow rising golf clap and a fresco on his way out the door. But 2022 is going to be different. They hired Lovey Smith as their new head coach, even though he's an old head coach. Holy hell, look at that beard. I want to swing from it. It looks like actor John Amos preparing for a role in a Santa Claus biopic. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Shut Up Football. I'm Jeff Stoltzfus. That's Kevin. And this episode, we can't shut up about the Houston Texans. This might be another bummer of a year for Texans fans. But just like Star Wars, there's a new hope an opportunity for the savvy fantasy football manager. Let's dig deep into the depth chart of the Houston Texans. There are no superstars here. The rookies aren't the flashiest. The vets are undervalued and overlooked. But there are good players here. Let's get into it. And now it's time for a breakdown. The Texans proved their conviction in second year passer Davis Mills by not taking a quarterback in this year's draft. Very smart. It wasn't the draft class to reach for a quarterback in. And Davis Mills played pretty well in his rookie year. How well? Amongst the six quarterbacks that saw the field in 2021, Davis Mills ranked fourth in passing yards, third in touchdowns, second in completion percentage, and third in passer rating, just behind Mac Jones and Trey Lance. He's right in the mix with the first rounders, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, and Justin Fields. Out of his 11 games started last year, you only saw two games where he earned average fantasy points for the position. The rest were below starter level. None were above. Part of that has to do with his lack of rushing upside. 10 foot 12 with a neck as long as a California sunset, he's a tall drink of water with a cannon for an arm. He's just not that mobile. He's like Carson Wentz with the mobility of a trash can on a windy day. I like Mills. I liked him before he was drafted. I just didn't see his path to being a starter in the NFL, but here it is. Still, he needs a big step forward to show he's the guy. He might have been their first pick in the draft, but third round draft capital is not a huge investment by the organization. I'd rather have his upside moving forward than Jared Goff, Sam Darnold, Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan, and maybe even Tua Tungavailoa, whom I think is in the same boat as Mills. It's a prove-it year for both. I think Mills could grow into something like Kirk Cousins, which feels like you're cheering for a B-plus instead of an A, but that's better than half the league. Kyle Allen and Jeff Driscoll are the backups. Neither matter for fantasy football. They might as well be John Amos and David Culley. Ha <laughs> ha! Callback! Mills is not someone you draft and redraft. But he could be a good streaming option this year. And he's a decent choice as a second quarterback in Superflex leagues. I think the Texans are going to pass a lot this year. With more experience and improved weapons, I expect some big yards out of Mills. In Dynasty, this is where I pump the brakes because as much as I believe in Davis Mills, I think he'll have a good career. I wouldn't invest in him. Not this year. If the team finishes bottom five, they're going to find themselves sitting pretty in next year's draft to find a replacement for Mills, and I don't believe they'll be able to resist doing so. Mills might make it hard for him, but short of earning a Pro Bowl or a ring, I think the Texans will pull the trigger on a new QB next year. This is based not on Mills' talent, but on league trends and the Texans' desperation to find a dynamic athlete at the position. You know, a Deshaun Watson type. It takes a lot of courage to pass on the next crop of Lamar Jacksons, Josh Allens, and Russell Wilsons. If you have Davis Mills in Dynasty, and he balls out through Halloween, start looking for trade partners. I hope I'm wrong, but in fantasy football, outside of Tom Brady, you would do well to have a QB who can outrun a Roomba. Today's episode is sponsored by... Nobody. 
<laughs> That's a hell of a thing. If you'd like to support the show, please like, subscribe, and click the bell. That's right, I'm a grown man asking you to like his YouTube video. These are the choices I've made in life. Rex Burkhead re-signed this offseason, one of the few rushers to return. People love Rex Burkhead. I mean, seriously, Twitter is full of love for him. Angry love, as they feel he's being disrespected. I mean, he was the leading rusher for the team last year. Wait, what? He was? With only 427 yards. Weird point to argue. Being the tallest kid in the class might make you king of the leprechauns, but it doesn't mean you can ride the rides at Disneyland. Burkhead barely managed to outrush Kyler Murray and Justin Fields, who, as it turns out, are not running backs and also missed several games. If you look at Rex Burkhead's stats last year, he had one big game. Week 16 against the Chargers, 149 yards and two touchdowns, which isn't nothing, but he had 29 rushing attempts and two receptions. That's volume. Volume I don't expect a 32-year-old running back to see this year. They signed Marlon Mack this offseason. After tearing his Achilles and being replaced by arguably the best running back in the league, Mack had to get the heck out of Indianapolis, so he took cheap money to come to a team where he'll actually see the field. An Achilles tear is serious, but I'm not worried about it. He came back last year. The Colts just didn't want to play him. I mean, why would you? Jonathan Taylor was a better runner, and Naheem Hines was a better pass catcher. Sorry, Marlon. Mack is a decent running back. He just needed to go to a team with lesser competition. He's 26 years old. I think there's still some good football left in him. He could be their leading rusher this year, but that might not be worth as much as it seems. The Texans drafted Damian Pierce out of Florida in the fourth round. 5'10", 224, he's got good size. His metrics won't wow you, but his other strengths make up for it. Good vision, good fight. He has some good receiving skills. He gets good yards after contact. At times, he looks like a bowling ball. He doesn't read as a true three down bell cow back. More likely, he's a valuable rotational guy. The thunder to somebody else's lightning. That being Mac this year, and more likely another off season addition next year. After that, we have Dare Ogumbawale and Royce Freeman. Neither has left much of a mark in the NFL and at age 28 and 26, they're unlikely to do so now. This backfield is a three-headed dog, but the roles and usage are widely debated and I think likely to shift over the course of the season, if not week to week. Typically, to guess the involvement, you just need to follow the money. Rex Burkhead got the most money for this year and the most guaranteed money overall. Hence, many believe he is the lead dog and another reason why so many feel he's being disrespected. But in this instance, I think it's less about the money and more about the timing. Burkhead was signed in January. Then Marlon Mack signed in early April. By the end of April, they had drafted Damian Pierce. I don't buy the money argument here because GM Nick Casario has shown how he values the position. Low. He's looking for good value and dedicating his resources to other positions. Burkhead has a low ceiling, but it made sense to bring him back. Marlon Mack provided a low-risk, low-money opportunity, and Pierce provides the team with youth, upside, and a low-draft capital investment. He Walmarted it, and that's fine for now. He had to add more weapons for Mills to find out what he has before next year's draft. So yeah, I think Burkhead, Mack, and Pierce will play in every game. I think Mack and Pierce grabbed the biggest pieces of the pie with a possible shift in majority from Mack to Pierce over the course of the year. Burkhead will be involved, but the usage will ebb and flow. Draft Marlon Mack low and redraft. I think he's going to lead the backfield, at least for half the year. I doubt anyone is buying him now, but if he has a good September and October, you might want to try and sell him in Dynasty for something, a Bed Bath & Beyond gift card, whatever. Buy Damian Pierce late in redraft. Buy him in Dynasty 2 if the ADP comes down. Right now, he's going about the middle of the second round, and there are still wide receivers I prefer there. I think he's going to have a decent rookie year, especially in December. However, for the long haul, I'd hesitate to put a ton of capital in him because I expect him to be joined next year by someone with more speed and maybe more pass-catching upside. That's the kind of back I'd rather invest in. But again, if Pierce falls to me later than I expected, I'd be tempted. I wouldn't draft Burkhead anywhere. 
I think it's foolish to do so. At best, I'd pick him up off the waiver wire as a streaming option if one of my running backs suffered an injury. I can feel the Jackal's skepticism on Marlon Mack as the lead back here, but just remember, out of all the running backs on this team, only one of them has had a thousand yard season before. It wasn't Pierce, and it wasn't Burkhead. Brandon Cooks was the top receiver last year with six touchdowns and over a thousand yards receiving. There's no reason he shouldn't lead the team again in yardage, touchdowns, and target share, which last year was around 24%, 11th best in the NFL. Last season, Cooks averaged satisfactory production in 8 out of 15 games. He exceeded expectations in Week 15 with 100 yards and two touchdowns. He only burned you in three games all year, and that's pretty impressive considering he went from Tyrod Taylor to a rookie on one of the worst teams in the league. I wouldn't call him quarterback proof, but... He does have the ability to turn short passes into long gains. Cooks continues to be undervalued, a steal in all formats. He's nearly 29 years old, but I wouldn't expect a drop in ability anytime soon. His age might just be enough to scare the Cooks manager in your dynasty league, so if you can trade for him, might be a good deal. Nico Collins was last year's third round investment. Six foot four with four five speed. He's a monster of an athlete. He didn't have much production last year, Collins wasn't much more than a dynasty hold, but there's a chance that that hold pays off this year. Collins should play outside, and Mills has the arm to find him deep. Also, at 6'4", he's a huge target in the end zone. He towers over the other receivers and even tight end Brevin Jordan. He's just a mismatch against corners and safeties, one that needs to be exploited. Compared to the other wide receivers selected near his draft selection, I'd take Nico Collins. That means Diami Brown, Amari Rogers, Anthony Schwartz. It'll be interesting to see if he outperforms the receivers taken before him. Dwayne Eskridge, Tutu Atwell, Terrace Marshall, and Josh Palmer. I think there's a good chance for that too. Maybe not Josh Palmer. You're my boy, JP. Nobody calls him that. If there's one thing I'd like to see Nico Collins improve on in year two, it's yards after the catch. In his rookie year, there's a surprising number of catches where he either went down on his own or was tackled way too easily. For all the athleticism, I wanted to see more broken tackles or cuts to make defenders miss. A stiff arm, something, it just wasn't there in year one. If you can add that in year two, he's a breakout candidate. John Mechie III was taken at the top of the second round out of Alabama this year. 5'11", a buck 89, he's not physically imposing. His college production was good, not great, but watch the tape. John Mechie was one of my favorites going into the draft. He's just special. The Texans moved up to select him. Likely, he'll be the slot receiver and he'll get immediate playing time. He's an excellent route runner. He has good fight and the ability to get yards after the catch. He has a good chance to soak up a lot of targets in the underneath to intermediate range. He might just be a safety valve for Davis Mills. Mechie has been a bit divisive for the fantasy community. Clearly, I'm in but it should be noted that he tore his ACL last year, and he's still working his way back from that. He should be okay by the start of the season, if not before. It's unlikely any other wide receivers on the roster have value outside these first three. The next level is Chris Conley, Chris Moore, and Philip Dorsett, all veteran depth pieces, all in their late 20s. Mining the bottom of the roster, there's Jalen Camp, Davian Harris, Connor Weddington, and Johnny Johnson III. I don't think anyone here is going to pop off either, but I always try to find one guy at the bottom that I like. And for me, that's Jalen Camp. He was a sixth round rookie by the Jaguars last year. He's got good size and athleticism. His tape showed some ability. If you're gonna keep an eye on anyone here, it's him. I like Cooks, Collins, and Mechie. I think they're all good, valuable players. Rank them by their estimated targets. Cooks is the obvious number one, a solid bet for his cost in redraft. In Dynasty, I'd hold him or trade for him. I think he's got a couple of good years left. Mechie is second for me. I think he's going to get a lot of targets and he can make the most of them. He's an easy buy in Dynasty. He's worth rostering in redraft, but it's hard to say draft him there because he's likely lingering at the back end of your draft. It will depend on your roster construction, but if you can, maybe sneak him onto your team. Collins is third for me, despite all the potential to break out. My concern at the end of the day is gonna be targets and consistency. I think he'll have a few big games. You just won't know when to start him. And Dynasty, I continue to hold. 
Last year's fifth round pick, Brevin Jordan, appears to have the edge as the top tight end. He's athletic, but a bit undersized for the position at only 6'3". His player profiler comparison is Harrison Bryant, whom I'd rather have, and is three inches taller. You'd think a better comparison would be Irv Smith, whom I'd rather have, and is more athletic. I initially liked Jordan coming out of college. His highlights were great, but when I watched more tape, I saw a lot of drops, and I began to doubt him. I don't know if the drops are behind him. If so, Jordan has value based on just how low he's going in leagues, which is to say, often undrafted. Pharaoh Brown is the vet and the big man. He's not athletically gifted, but he is six foot six and he has been known to make the occasional one-handed catch over the middle. He's a decent depth tight end with the ability to grab a touchdown here or there. I think they want Brevin Jordan to be the guy, which leaves only scraps for Brown. Finally, in the fifth round of this year's draft, the Texans took Tegan Quinton Tarantino. Quintoriano? Well, what did I say? Oh. Well, mine's better. Rebrand, Tegan! Tegan Quintoriano, seen here waging war on his underpants after an all prunes breakfast, finally kicked in. He's six foot six. His metrics are meh. His tape is meh. He looks like bacon smells. I'm not sure what the Texans see in him. He doesn't do much for me. Looking at the draft order, all the good tight end prospects were already gone. Maybe they felt like they were addressing a need, but there were still a lot of good running back prospects left at that point. They could have found the lightning to go with Damian Pierce's thunder. Brevin Jordan in redraft? Sure, as a late round dart throw with some upside, you could do worse. In Dynasty, he's a hold. Maybe even in best ball as extra in the last round, he might surprise one week. I wouldn't invest in Farrow or Quentin Tarantino anywhere. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was boring until the end, and enough with the feet. In 2021, D-lineman Malik Collins played 54.8% of total snaps. That's the most by a Texans interior defender, so based on volume alone, he's a name to watch. Jonathan Greenard had the best season of any Texans lineman for IDP last year. He had 8 sacks, 33 tackles, 12 QB hits, and 9 tackles for loss. And he only played 36% of total snaps. He missed 5 games last year. Camus Gruger Hill was pretty good last year. He was top 25 in position in total points and average points per week. He exploded in week 13 versus the Colts with double digit tackles, assists, 3 tackles for loss, and a sack. He probably won't improve beyond that this year, but he's a good spot start in IDP leagues, along with his teammate Christian Kirksey. The Texans drafted Christian Harris out of Alabama in the third round. He seems better in pass coverage than against the run. He's very athletic, but struggles to read plays and sometimes gets taken out of position to make a tackle. His metrics make him intriguing, but he looks like he'll need some time to marinate in the NFL. I wouldn't bother in Dynasty, not this year. Derek Stingley Jr. was drafted third overall. If your league requires cornerbacks, he's an easy bet. However, if you simply need a defensive back, I'd still favor safety over cornerback. Is there a safety I want on this team? Nope. So outside of fantasy football, what do I actually think of the team? Will they be better this year? Well, they won four games last year, so yeah, I think they can win five games this year. In fact, I looked at the schedule and I think they win exactly five games this year. But... I bet they lose a lot better this year. Baby steps. You're on the way up. Slowly. Thanks for watching Shut Up Football. We'll catch you next time. Peace! Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. sound right boy and i looked them square in the eye and said you call me andy dufresne and hit me from behind with a brick and he liked it <laughs>